Hello and welcome back. In my first video on the early Christian ecclesia or congregation, I discussed how Christians were sent to preach only to the Jews and how they faced persecution from the religious Jews of their day, mainly the Sadducees and the Pharisees. In this video, part two, I will talk about how Christianity spread to the Gentiles. In part one, I mentioned how Stephen was the first martyr after Jesus to be killed by the Jews. Not content with slaying Stephen, the Jewish religious leaders launched the first great persecution against the Christians in Jerusalem. This persecution scattered the disciples through the regions of Judea and Samaria and other areas in the Gentile world. So this religious persecution by the religious Jews drove the Christians to these cities far beyond Jerusalem. This is because God wanted to spread the good news of the kingdom to the Gentile nations. And so this brings us to the account of the Apostle Paul's conversion. This account is mentioned in Acts chapter 9, and it takes place shortly after Paul witnessed the stoning of Stephen. We'll read this directly from the Bible in chapter 9 of Acts verse 1. It says, Now Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, that if he found anyone belonging to the way, whether men or women, he could bring them bound to Jerusalem. Christians weren't first known as Christians until the congregation in Antioch was formed by Paul and Barnabas. The general names by which the early Christians called themselves were brothers, disciples, believers, or saints. The first recorded use of the term Christian is found in the New Testament in Acts chapter 11, verse 26 where it says, After Barnabas brought Saul to Antioch, where they taught the disciples for about a year, the text then says the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The name Christian occurs only three times in the New Testament. This name was not given by Christians nor by Jews to identify themselves, but rather by the heathens of that time period. When the new Gentile converts joined the congregations at Antioch, they were no longer all Nazarenes or Galileans or Greek Jews, and to the people in Antioch they seemed to be a new sect who didn't acknowledge the emperors of Rome. Though this name was first given in ridicule, it became a symbol of honor and a term proudly borne by the early Christians starting in the Antioch congregation. And we'll continue on with the story of Paul in verse 3. Now while he was going along, it came to pass that when he drew near to Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven shined around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound of the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground, but when his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and did not eat or drink. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And in a vision the Lord said to him, Ananias, and he said, See, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street that is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one named Saul. A man of Tarsus, for look, he is praying, and he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him, so that he would receive his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your holy ones at Jerusalem, and he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name here. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is a chosen vessel to me to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias departed and went into the house, and laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, so that you can receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he received his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. The conversion of Paul the Apostle on the road to Damascus was an event in the life of Paul that led him to cease persecuting early Christians and to become a follower of Jesus. It is normally dated to around 36 AD. 
Paul would have been somewhere between 28 to 31 years of age at his conversion. Though the new covenant was put in force at Christ's death on the cross and the old law covenant was put aside, it took a few years after this until the Gentiles were fully welcomed into the ecclesia of Jesus. Jesus sent the Apostle Paul to preach to the Gentiles, and he was a powerful force in spreading the good news of the kingdom to the nations. Paul was born in Tarsus in Cilicia around 1 or 5 AD in the province in the southeastern corner of modern-day Turkey. He was of Benjamite lineage and Hebrew ancestry. His parents were Pharisees, fervent Jewish nationalists who adhered strictly to the law of Moses who sought to protect their children from contamination from the Gentiles. Anything Greek would have been despised in Saul's household, yet he could speak Greek and passable Latin. His household would have spoken Aramaic, a derivative of Hebrew, which was the official language of Judea. Saul's family were Roman citizens, but viewed Jerusalem as a truly sacred and holy city. At age 13, Saul was sent to Palestine to learn from a rabbi named Gamaliel under whom Saul mastered Jewish history and the works of the prophets. His education would continue for five or six years as Saul learned such things as dissecting scripture. It was during this time that he developed a question-and-answer style of teaching known in ancient times as diatribe. This method of articulation helped rabbis debate the finer points of the Jewish law to either defend or prosecute those who broke the law. All signs pointed to his becoming a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court of 71 men who ruled over Jewish life and religion. Saul was zealous for his faith, and this faith did not allow for any compromise. It is this zeal that led Saul down the path to a religious extremism. In Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 42, Peter delivered his defense of the gospel and of Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin, which Saul would have heard. Gamaliel was also present and delivered a message to calm the council and prevent them from stoning Peter. Saul might have also been present at the trial of Stephen. Paul spent time in Arabia, Damascus, Jerusalem, Syria, and his native Cilicia, and Barnabas enlisted his help to teach those in the congregation in Antioch. Interestingly, the Christians driven out of Judea by persecution that arose after Stephen's death founded this multiracial congregation in Antioch. Paul took his first of three missionary journeys in the late 40s AD. As he spent more time in Gentile areas, Saul began to go by his Roman name, Paul, as mentioned in Acts 13 verse 9. The Apostle Paul spent his life proclaiming the risen Christ Jesus and the kingdom of God throughout the Roman world often at great peril to himself. On three separate missionary journeys, each several years in length, Paul preached the news of Jesus in many coastal cities and trade route towns. The following is a brief summary of these missionary tours. Here's a map of his first missionary journey that he took. Answering God's call to proclaim Jesus, Paul and Barnabas left the congregation at Antioch in Syria. At first, their method of evangelism was to preach in the town synagogues, but when many of the Jews rejected Christ, the missionaries recognized God's call of witnessing to the Gentiles. In the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas first sailed to the island of Cyprus, which was Barnabas' home territory. They arrived at Salamis and taught in the synagogues along with John Mark, Barnabas' cousin. The three continued preaching across the whole island, and finally arrived at Paphos on the opposite side. In Paphos, the proconsul Sergius Paulus summoned Paul and Barnabas because he sought to hear the word of God. However, a Jewish false prophet and magician named Elymas tried to prevent the proconsul from coming to faith. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, struck Elymas blind, thus performing his first miracle. This is mentioned in Acts chapter 13, verse 9. Upon witnessing the miracle, the proconsul believed. Paul and Barnabas then set sail from Paphos to go into modern-day Turkey, while John Mark set sail to return to Jerusalem. In Turkey, Paul and Barnabas made their way to Antioch. There were two Antiochs, one in Turkey and also the Antioch in Syria from where they came. They taught in the synagogue and many believed. However, the following week, when nearly the entire city gathered to hear their preaching, some Jews began contradicting them 
and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. This story you can find in Acts, the 13th chapter, starting in verse 44. It says, And the next Sabbath almost the whole city was gathered together to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with jealousy and contradicted the things that were spoken by Paul, speaking defaming words. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you thrust it away from you and judge yourselves unworthy of life in the age to come, look, we are turning to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, so that you bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorified the word of God. And as many as appointed themselves to life in the age to come, believed. Now Paul kept running into these uh, religious Jews, and they were so stubbornly against, you know, the message of the gospel. This happened time and time again, as you'll notice when we cover his three missionary tours. After this rejection of the gospel from the Jews, Paul said, We are turning to the Gentiles. Eventually, being driven out of Antioch by the Jews, Paul and Barnabas went to Iconium and taught in the synagogues there, and many believed, and Paul and Barnabas performed signs and wonders during their stay in Iconium. Over time, however, the city became divided between those who followed the Jews and those who sided with the apostles. When Paul and Barnabas learned that their opposition was planning to stone them, they fled to Lystra, Derbe, and the surrounding area. Read that account in Acts chapter 14. The Jews were always stirring up trouble for them. In Lystra, Paul performed another miracle, healing a man who had been crippled since birth. Unfortunately, the miracle caused the people to believe that Barnabas was the god Zeus and that Paul was Hermes, the messenger and chief spokesman of the gods. Paul and Barnabas had to work hard to convince the people that they were mere men and prevent them from making sacrifices to them. Then Jews from Antioch in Turkey and from Iconium came and persuaded the crowds to stone Paul. After the stoning, Paul was dragged out of the city and left for dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he got up and walked right back into Lystra. The next day, he and Barnabas went to Derbe and shared the gospel. Many more disciples were made. Upon completing their time in Derby, Paul and Barnabas retraced their steps, returning through Lystra to Iconium to Antioch and Turkey to encourage the believers there before making the trip home to Antioch and Syria. To get from Antioch and Turkey to Antioch and Syria, they passed through Perga and set sail from Italia, taking the time to share the gospel in both places. The entire missionary journey is believed to have taken 12 to 18 months, thus putting Paul and Barnabas home in Syria around A.D. 48. In Antioch in Syria, Paul and Barnabas gathered the congregation together, and they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to many Gentiles. Paul's second missionary journey is recorded in Acts chapter 15 through chapter 18. A year or two after completing their first missionary journey, Barnabas suggested that he and Paul revisit the congregations that they had planted. A disagreement arose over whether or not John Mark, who had left them on the first journey, should join them on this journey. Evidently, Barnabas decided to take John Mark to Cyprus, while Paul took Silas to modern-day Turkey. Paul and Silas picked up Timothy, a young but well-spoken-of believer in Lystra. The three men then continued to strengthen the faith in those new Christian congregations, and the number of new believers increased daily. Paul, Silas, and Timothy desired to enter Asia to spread the gospel there, but the Holy Spirit prevented them. Finally, in Troas, Paul received a vision of a man asking them to go into Macedonia, modern-day Greece. That account is in Acts chapter 16, 1 through 10. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, now joined by Luke, sailed from Troas to Greece and made their way to Philippi. Lydia, a wealthy merchant, opened her heart to the gospel and her home to become the meeting place for the congregation in Philippi. This is just one example of how early Christians met oftentimes in just homes. Not some fancy gaudy building wasn't necessary. They pretty much just met wherever they could. Later, Paul cast demons out of a slave girl whose owner then brought Paul and Silas before the city magistrates for what they had done. Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown in prison, 
but they continued to praise God from their jail cell. That night, God caused an earthquake to release all the prisoners, but none fled the jail. Because the prisoners stayed, Paul was able to share the gospel with the jailer who believed and was baptized. In the morning, the magistrates freed Paul and Silas, but Paul refused to leave without a public apology for the way they had violated his rights as a Roman citizen. After this incident, Paul, Silas, and Timothy traveled to Thessalonica with monetary support from the new congregation in Philippi. That account is in Acts chapter 16, 11 through 40. Paul preached in the synagogue in Thessalonica, and some Jews believed, as well as many Greeks, including some of the leading women. Unfortunately, the non-believing Jews formed a violent mob, so Paul and Silas had to escape at night to Berea. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 2-6 through 6, tells how Timothy spent time in Thessalonica to establish and exhort the new believers in their faith, and how he later came to Paul with an encouraging report on the status of their walk with God. In Berea, Paul again shared the gospel in the synagogue. Yeah, that was his pattern. Paul liked to go to the Jewish synagogues first. The Bereans listened to Paul's teaching and carefully examined scripture to determine if his teaching was true. So many in Berea believed the gospel message. Unfortunately, the non-believing Jews from Thessalonica arrived in Berea to stir up trouble again. So Paul was sent off to sail to Athens by himself, while Timothy and Silas stayed behind. When Paul reached Athens, he preached both in the synagogue and in the marketplace. He used references to their own unknown God and quoted the Greek poet Aratus, who wrote the Phenomena in order to appeal to the Athenians. Aratus was a Greek poet of Soli in Cilicia, Paul's hometown, who lived from the year 315 to 245 BCE. He was best remembered for his poem on astronomy. His book was called The Phenomena. After the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Phenomena was the most widely read poem in the ancient world. Its fame was immediate. It was also translated into Latin. It was a manual in verse that teaches the reader to identify constellations and predict weather. The poem also explains the relationship between celestial phenomena and such human affairs as agriculture and navigation. Anyway, it was a very popular book in its day. Paul always spoke to the crowd, so he used, he referred to that book there in that case. Back to the Athenians. Some Athenians believed what Paul said, and while others mocked, and others seemed interested only in intellectual stimulation. So Paul continued on to Corinth. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 3 reveals that Paul arrived in Corinth in weakness and in fear and much trembling after the repeated persecution he had suffered in the previous cities. In Corinth, Paul met fellow Jews and tent makers Aquila and Priscilla and decided to stay and work with them. Paul began his year and a half ministry in Corinth by teaching in the synagogue and was soon joined by Silas and Timothy. Unfortunately, the Corinthian Jews opposed and reviled Paul, so he turned his attention again to the Gentiles. See, God kept reaching out to the Jews, but they kept fighting and resisting stubbornly. Many Corinthian Gentiles believed and were baptized. During his time in Corinth, Paul also wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians to encourage the Thessalonian believers in the persecution they suffered and to teach them right living. Paul also received another vision from God encouraging him to continue preaching the gospel despite upcoming hardship. After this vision, the Jews brought Paul before Gallio, the proconsul, arguing that he was teaching worship contrary to the law. Gallio refused to hear the case without Paul even having to speak a word in his own defense. So Paul continued in Corinth many days longer. When it was time to return to Antioch in Syria, Priscilla and Aquila accompanied Paul as he sailed to Ephesus and shared the gospel there. The Ephesians were eager to have Paul stay, but he declined hoping to return at a later time. Priscilla and Aquila settled in Ephesus while Paul sailed on to Caesarea. He then made his way to his home congregation in Antioch in Syria and shared the work that God had done over the previous two or three years he had been gone. After updating his home congregation in Antioch in Syria of the things God had done during his second missionary journey, Paul departed again on a third missionary journey to strengthen the congregations he had planted previously. 
This journey is recorded in Acts chapter 18 through chapters 21. In approximately 52 AD, Paul went through Galatia visiting the churches in Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch in Turkey, which he had planted during his first missionary journey five years previously. He went to Ephesus where he had spent a significant amount of time during his second missionary journey. There he met twelve men who had been instructed by another Jewish believer, Apollos. Unfortunately, at the time, Apollos only knew Jesus' story up to John's baptism, so he had only taught the twelve men about the baptism of repentance. The twelve men had not been born again by faith in Christ's sacrifice on the cross, nor had they received the Holy Spirit. Paul explained to them the complete gospel message. The men were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul then laid his hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit as a sign of their new life in Christ. Paul spent three months preaching in the synagogue in Ephesus, but when the people became stubborn and continued in unbelief, Paul withdrew with the disciples and began reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus, continued teaching and doing extraordinary miracles there for two years until all the people in the area had heard the word of the Lord. During this time, seven sons of the Jewish high priest Sceva tried to capitalize on Paul's fame by using Jesus and Paul's names to perform an exorcism. The evil spirit acknowledged the authority of Jesus and knew Paul, but it did not know or submit to the sons of Sceva. Instead, it attacked the seven men who eventually fled the house naked and wounded. When the Ephesians learned of the incident, Jesus' name was revered all the more, and many who practiced magic arts repented of all their ways and even burned their books. It is also during this time in Ephesus that Paul wrote the letter that is 1 Corinthians. After these events in Ephesus, Paul felt led by the Holy Spirit to continue his missionary journey, then return to Jerusalem, and eventually make his way to Rome. In preparation, he sent Timothy and Erastus ahead to Macedonia. While Paul stayed behind in Ephesus, a silversmith, Demetrius, who made his living fastening idols to the goddess Artemis, incited a riot against Paul because Paul's preaching threatened his way of life. After several hours of rioting, the town clerk was able to calm the crowd down and send everyone home, instructing them to bring their grievances against Paul to court for a proper hearing. Paul then quietly bid farewell to the disciples in Ephesus and sailed to Macedonia, where he wrote his letter that is Second Corinthians, while visiting them in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea, before finally making his way to Corinth. After three months in Corinth, where Paul wrote the letter that is Romans, He planned to sail to Syria. However, he discovered a plot by the non-believing Jews to waylay him on the voyage. So he decided instead to return through Macedonia, retracing his steps through Berea, Thessalonica, and Philippi. In Philippi, he met up with Luke. The two men then sailed to Troas, where they met up with traveling companions on their way to Jerusalem from various congregations. These representatives were probably bringing monetary gifts to the persecuted disciples in Jerusalem. They spent one week in Troas, and on the final day, Paul preached late into the night. A young man, Eutychus, who had been listening from a third-story window, fell asleep and plummeted to the ground below to his death. Paul, however, raised him from the dead and continued preaching until daybreak. You can imagine how that miracle affected the crowd. And then many in Troas there became believers. uh, That account is in Acts 20, verses 3 through 12. Paul walked to Assos while the rest of the traveling companions sailed to that port and took Paul aboard there. Then they sailed to Miletus near Ephesus, making a few stops along the way. Paul was in a rush to arrive in Jerusalem, so rather than visiting Ephesus where he would feel compelled to stay longer than he wished, he chose to have some of the brothers from Ephesus to meet him in Miletus for a final word of encouragement and farewell. Paul, Luke, and their companions then continued to sail to Tyre in Syria, making short stops in Kos, Rhodes, and Patara along the way. They stayed in Tyre seven days. Many disciples there urged Paul not to go into Jerusalem, where he was sure to face persecution. Paul, however, continued on his journey sailing to Ptolemais and then to Caesarea. During his stay in Caesarea, a Jewish prophet named Agabus prophesied that Paul would be bound and delivered into the hands of the Gentiles when he went to Jerusalem. The disciples continued to try to dissuade Paul from entering Jerusalem, but Paul declared, I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Seeing that Paul could not be persuaded, the disciples stopped arguing with him and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. Paul and the disciples then entered Jerusalem, where the fellow believers received them gladly. So ended Paul's third missionary journey around approximately four years after he left his home congregation of Antioch in Syria. Shortly thereafter, Paul was beheaded at the hands of Emperor Nero. The Apostle Paul certainly fulfilled every part of the commission that Christ had given him to spread Christianity to the Gentile nations. It's interesting that through all of his three missionary tours, the religious Jews always tried to persecute him wherever he went. Some listened, but most did not. The Jews were for the most part not responsive to the kingdom message, but the Gentiles were. The Apostle Paul wrote 13 letters to the different congregations he had helped form. These are included in the New Testament. Some scholars believe it's actually 14 letters because there's some debate regarding the book of Hebrews. The chronological list of letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament are Galatians, around A.D. 47, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, between A.D. 51 and 59, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans between A.D. 52 and 56, the books of Ephesians, Philemon, Colossians, and Philippians, A.D. 60 to 62. Paul wrote these during his first Roman imprisonment. 1st Timothy and Titus, A.D. 62, 2nd Timothy between A.D. 63 and 64 during Paul's second imprisonment. The book of Hebrews was written by either Paul or Barnabas. The Apostle Paul is a very zealous Christian and a good example for us Christians in modern times today. He was tireless in his ministry and he was on fire in his preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. He suffered much persecution from the religious Jews who were stubborn and would not accept Jesus as their king. Because of their stubbornness, God turned his attention to the Gentiles. Okay, I'm going to end this video here, but stay tuned for part 3 in this series where we take a look at how God used the Apostle Peter also to bring the kingdom message to the Gentile nations. Thanks very much for watching.